If you only watched the WWE prior to 2016, then you might not have been familiar with the work of Bobby Roode. At that point, he was one of the rare North American performers who had spent his whole career working for other promotions, after all. Still, despite this, he'd certainly built up a huge fan following for himself, one that led many to eventually demand he get his shot in the big leagues. And of course, this would ultimately happen, but how did his career go after he made the jump? And what was his story before he got there? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey so far in Glorious! The Bobby Roode Story Robert Francis Roode was born on May 11, 1976 in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, and it was while growing up there that he developed a keen athletic streak, with the youngster excelling particularly in hockey, where he would go as far as to play in the Canadian minor leagues. As well as that, Bobby also had an interest in pro wrestling, this eventually leading to him seeking out training in this too. And this training would ultimately be carried out by fellow Ontarians Shane Sewell and Sean Morley, the latter of which will be more familiar to WWE fans as Val Venus. So well did the training go, in fact, that come 1998, Rude would have fallen in love with the ring so much he decided to make it his main focus from then on in. Following and then began traveling around the Canadian indie circuit building up a name for himself, a name that would eventually bring him to other countries such as Puerto Rico and of course the United States, the latter being where he would work a few dark matches for WWE, even making the odd appearance on B-shows like Sunday Night Heat and Velocity. Unfortunately though, Bobby would not get signed by Vince McMahon's promotion at this time and so he continued to hone his craft with the hopes that he'd one day get another chance. This was what saw him return to his home country, where he would not only become the NWA Shockwave Internet Champion on March 18, 2006, but also the NWA Shockwave Heavyweight Champion as well, just eight days later. And proving to be a fighting champion even at this early stage of his career, the youngster would go on to defend both belts for the next couple of months, becoming the talk of the Ontario scene in the process. But that wasn't all he was doing at this point because, in his personal life, he would also be getting married to his longtime sweetheart Tracy, with the two remaining together to this day and having three sons, Robert, Riley, and Nicholas. Still, for as much as his life was going through an upward swing, Bobby knew that the Indies weren't going to sustain him for much longer as, now with a new bride, he had to start making some real money. Luckily for him then, opportunity would soon come calling and would be in the form of TNA. Yes, Total Nonstop Action Wrestling had formed just a couple of years earlier out of the ashes of the Monday Night Wars, and by that point, it had become the only real option for a North American wrestler to get on TV if they weren't working with WWE. So when the Peterborough native was brought in by Scott Demore in May of 2004, it felt like Christmas and New Year's wrapped into one as Rude took the opportunity with gusto, immediately setting about establishing himself as a future star of the promotion. And during those early days, TNA certainly showed a lot of promise as a genuine alternative for fans who missed the likes of WCW and ECW and didn't want to be limited to just one big wrestling company. Of course, the future Glorious One would be a major component of this, with him often putting on stellar performances and quickly grabbing the attention of fans as he became part of the Team Canada stable, a stable that would regularly find themselves feuding with the likes of America's Most Wanted and the three live crew more often than not, coming out on the winning end. So much success did they have in fact that on October 12th of that year, two of the team's members, Rude and Eric Young, would go on to win the NWA World Tag Team titles for a brief time as the former's role of the heavy of the group only continued to blossom, with him even at one point taking on the moniker of the Canadian Enforcer and coming to the ring in flashy, Rick Rude-esque sequined robes. That said, for as successful as Team Canada was, wrestling logic dictates that all units will eventually have to implode, and so, after two years together, they were ultimately forced to disband after losing a match where their very existence had been put on the line, this causing Bobby to go out on his own and begin referring to himself as the company's hottest free agent. This period would see him court a number of different managers in fact, with each of them trying to woo him with promises of stardom and title wins in the weeks that followed. In the end though, it was Tracy Brooks who was able to gain his services, and from there, Robert Roode, as he would now call himself, changed his gimmick to more closely resemble that of a Wall Street stock trader, heavily influenced by the likes of Gordon Gecko. 
And with this new direction firmly set in place, Robert started a feud with his former teammate Eric Young, a feud that would ultimately end with Young once again joining forces with him as Robert Roode Inc. began to grow into a stable of its own. Sadly though, this stable would not get a chance to develop any further as, after weeks of distrust had built up between the former Team Canada members, it was eventually revealed that Jeff Jarrett had been in Young's ear the whole time with the intent of turning him against his partner. This leading to a blow-off match between the Chosen One and the Ontario Boy at May 13, 2007's Sacrifice. And on that night, Rude would be able to overcome his opponent, picking up the win by the end of that match. He wouldn't be so lucky the next month at Slammiversary, however, when Eric Young was able to pin him, this formally severing any remaining ties between the two men. Still, unwilling to let this get him down for too long, Robert took Tracy Brooks along with him as he went on to align himself with Christian's coalition soon afterwards. During this period, though, the future NXT champion would begin to take his frustrations out on his manager more and more, with his bullying of her becoming an ongoing side story as he entered into programs with the likes of Frankie Kazarian and Junior Fatu. In fact, it would be after losing a match to the latter that Rude would finally get his just desserts when Brooks decided she'd had enough of his misogynistic ways and turned her back on him, this ending up leading to Bobby suffering a number of losses against the likes of Samoa Joe and Booker T in the months that followed as, now without his manager by his side, he became lost in the wilderness for a time, largely becoming a side character in the ongoing feud between Christian Cage and Kurt Angle. After a while, though, he would appear to mend fences with Tracy, this leading to the two teaming up once more in a mixed tag team match at January 6, 2008's Final Resolution. Unfortunately, however, this match would not only end with Bobby swerving everyone by turning on her, but also with him laying out Charmel with a right hook, this causing her husband Booker T to vow revenge. And so, the first match between these two was set to take place at the following months against All Odds pay-per-view during which the heel would be so scared of getting in the ring with his opponent that he would actually end up fleeing the building instead. When a second attempt was made to get the match going then at March 9th's Destination X, it was ruled that both men would be tied to each other by the wrist so as to stop either of them from escaping in a Stand By Your Man strap match. Ultimately though, it would be Rude who would win that night, this setting him up for the next phase of his career which would see him return to the tag division as part of his most memorable unit yet. Yes, on the June 12, 2008 episode of Impact, the Heel Enforcer formally joined forces with James Storm, with the two from there rechristening themselves as Beer Money Inc., a couple of hard-drinking brawlers who knew how to make a buck or two while they were at it. And together, they would quickly become the TNA World Tag Team Champions after defeating LAX at August 10th's Hard Justice, with them from there going on to hold the belts for the rest of the year as they established themselves as the most dominant force in the tag team division going through duos like the Motor City Machine Guns and Matt Morgan and Abyss with ease. At a certain point, in fact, they became so popular that the company was forced to turn them babyface after they aligned themselves with Team 3D during their battles with the British Invasion in mid-2009, a series that ultimately saw Beer Money become three-time tag team champions by the end of it. Come 2010, though, with the introduction of Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff into TNA, things began to change for the promotion, and the focus became less about providing an alternative to WWE with fresh young talent and more about trying to leech off the successes of the past, as Beer Money became one of a number of acts whose TV time was drastically reduced so as to make way for older legends like Mick Foley and Ric Flair. This saw much of the goodwill the company had built up with fans begin to evaporate, and also saw Beer Money turn heel once again with them reasoning that this was the only way they were ever going to get noticed by the new management. And this did work as it happened, because soon after that, they would become aligned with AJ Styles, Desmond Wolfe, Frankie Kazarian, and Ric Flair, with the Nature Boy going on to christen the whole group as Fortune, the newest incarnation of his famous Four Horsemen stable. And now part of Fortune, Beer Money set about regaining their tag team titles once again. However, they would not have any luck with this, despite getting multiple shots over the remainder of the year. Thankfully then, by the time 2011 came around, their fortunes began to change, and on January 9th at Genesis, they were finally able to topple the Motor City Machine Guns to become champions for the fourth time. Soon after that and the stable collectively turned babyface, however, this only led to Ric Flair, who had been out with an injury at this point, turning on them upon his return. And so now, without their leader behind them, Fortune entered into a program with Immortal, the very stable Flair had jumped ship to, 
This being one that would see Rude get to tap out the Nature Boy during that year's Lethal Lockdown match in his final act of revenge. Of course, as well as all this, Beer Money still had to fend off challengers to their tag team titles, and they continued to do this throughout the first half of the year, becoming the longest reigning TNA Tag Team Champions in the process after holding on to them for a full 212 days by the end. And even when they did eventually lose them, it was done with a purpose in mind as by now, plans were being put in place to take Bobby to the next level, a level that would see him become the top champion in the promotion by the end of that year. Yes, that's right, from June to September of 2011, the now former tag team champion had been taking part in the Bound for Glory series to determine the number one contender for Kurt Angle's TNA World title, and after winning that tournament, he would finally get his shot at October 16th's Bound for Glory. Despite his best efforts though, this first attempt would end up failing after the Olympic hero resorted to cheating. This however only served to strengthen his resolve even more, as from there, Rude began demanding a fair rematch. And while Angle would refuse to give him this, he would soon end up losing his prized belt to Bobby's teammate James Storm anyway, this giving the Canadian the in he needed as he was able to challenge Storm soon thereafter, the bout eventually being set for the November 3rd episode of Impact. And on that night, finally, after years of working his way to the top, the TNA stalwart was able to pin his partner to become the champ for the very first time, turning heel in the process as he from there dissolved beer money and went out on his own once more. After that, the new top dog would go on a run of successful title defenses against the likes of AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Bully Ray, Rob Van Dam, and Sting, firmly establishing himself as the guy in the promotion from there on in. Come the end of his run at the top, in fact, he would have held on to the belt for 256 days, this at that point being the longest world title reign in the company's history. And even when he did lose it to Austin Aries at July 8th, 2012's Destination X, he remained firmly fitted into the main event scene, as he from there continued his feud with James Storm, the two having a number of brawls in the months that followed. By the end of this program, in fact, Rude would have been able to once again become the number one contender to the TNA title, though he would ultimately fail to win this back when he faced off against Jeff Hardy at December's final resolution. After that, he began teaming with the man who had initially taken his belt away, Austin Aries, as the two went on to have great success together, even winning the TNA tag titles on the January 31st, 2013 episode of Impact. And they would spend the spring following this defending them against all comers, often putting on show-stealing performances each time they did. That said, the tag division was never destined to be Bobby's full-time spot at this point in his career, so when the duo lost their belts and disbanded soon thereafter, the future Glorious One moved back to the singles division where he entered the 2013 Bound for Glory series, hoping to once again win the whole thing and get another world title shot in the process. And though he wouldn't end up winning that year, he would find new allegiances in the form of Christopher Daniels and Frankie Kazarian, with the trio going on to label themselves Ego as they entered into feuds with the likes of Magnus and Kurt Angle in the weeks that followed. And it was the latter superstar who Rude would face off against at that October's Bound for Glory, then again on the following week's Impact, beating him both times after the Olympic hero began developing kayfabe concussion symptoms. Not long after this and the Canadian would begin to vent his frustration at the company's owner Dixie Carter, arguing that he was not being given enough title opportunities despite his impressive string of victories. He even kayfabe threatened to leave TNA at this point and was only talked out of doing so after being offered 10% stock of the company should he win his next match, something which he of course didn't end up doing. Following this, and Rude began teasing a face turn as he reunited with Eric Young and got into a feud with MVP and Bobby Lashley, this all leading to the October 28, 2014 episode of Impact when the former TNA champion was able to once again become the current TNA champion after pinning Lashley from there going on another string of successful title defenses over the next three months. After that ended, however, 2015 would see something of a lull for the former two-time champ, and it wasn't until January of 2016 that things started to look up again, as it was then that he would formally turn babyface and reform beer money with James Storm. And this saw the two go on a crowd-pleasing run for the next few months, even becoming tag team champions one more time on the March 8th episode of Impact. Sadly though, that would be his last title run in the company, as just 11 days later, the Peterborough native would announce that he was leaving TNA, with him choosing not to sign a new contract at that time and instead roll the dice on a new life in WWE. 
Yes, after nearly two decades in the industry, Rude was finally coming to the big leagues in North America, as on the April 1st TakeOver Dallas show, he would be pictured in the front row, with him making his in-ring debut soon thereafter at the NXT tour of the UK in June, beating Angelo Dawkins in a convincing effort. From there, he would start making appearances on TV, working his way through a number of opponents and establishing himself as a heel, despite having the most crowd-pleasing entrance in the company at the time, an entrance that would become a huge part of his appeal going forward as a chorus of singers would introduce him as being glorious each and every time he came through the curtain. And the glorious one was certainly able to live up to this moniker as, come August 20th's TakeOver Brooklyn 2, he would pick up a win over Andrade Cien Almas this putting him in line for an eventual shot at Shinsuke Nakamura's NXT title down the line. By January of 2017 at TakeOver San Antonio, this shot would finally come, and after taking the King of Strong Style to the limit for nearly 30 minutes, Rude was able to get the pin and become the top guy on the black and yellow brand as he ended the night holding the championship above his head. Following this, the title defenses would rack up as he beat Cassius Ono, Hideo Itami, and Roderick Strong. It wouldn't be until a Scottish psychopath in the form of Drew McIntyre challenged him that the first signs of fear would begin to show on the champ, and this fear turned out to be merited as, in the end, Drew was able to beat Rude at TakeOver Brooklyn 3 that August, this effectively writing him off NXT as he was by then being primed for a main roster run. And this main roster run would formally begin on the August 22nd episode of SmackDown, where the Glorious One would debut as a babyface, making quick work of undercard talent like Aiden English and Mike Kanellis before moving his way up the ladder as he began a feud with Dolph Ziggler over the course of the autumn. And during that feud, Rude would prove to be the better man, winning every match between the two as he next set his sights on the United States title, which had just been vacated at that point. This led to the January 16th, 2018 episode of SmackDown, where the former TNA superstar was able to pin Jinder Mahal in the finals of a tournament to crown the new champion, with him from there going on to hold the belt for 54 days before dropping it to Randy Orton. After that, now feeling that he'd made an impact as a singles star, he moved over to the tag division, teaming up with former Olympic athlete Chad Gable when they were moved over to Raw during that year's draft. And together, the two went on to have a number of dominating performances against the likes of The Ascension and the Authors of Pain, the latter of which being the team they would beat to become the Raw Tag Team Champions on December 10th. As if that weren't a nice enough Christmas present, however, the duo would even get a chance to defend their belts against one of the best tag teams in the company following this, as they started a feud with the Revival into the new year, a feud which would eventually see them drop their gold to them come February. Frustrated by this then, Rude would turn his back on Gable, and in the process, turn heel for the first time on the main roster, as he once again changed his name to Robert Rude. But he wouldn't be alone for long though, because that August, he would find another new partner in Dolph Ziggler, with this ultimately proving to be a fortuitous team-up, as with Dolph now by his side, the Canadian was able to regain the tag team titles on the September 15th episode of Raw. After that, Rude would get his first taste of the main event when he and his tag partner teamed up with Baron Corbin to go after Roman Reigns over the course of the winter. That was until the former NXT champion would unfortunately be pulled from TV after failing a drug test in December. When he did return on January 10th, 2020, it would now be part of the SmackDown brand, where he would continue to team with the show-off as they set their sights on the blue brand's tag titles. Any plans that the company may have had for this to happen were thrown up into the air, however, when the worldwide shutdown hit. This meaning Bobby would be stuck in Canada until June of that year, at which point he would return to take part in the Thunderdome era of the company, still partnering up with Ziggler but having no luck in winning any more gold. And as the world has started to open back up again, that's the position he's remained in. Could he be a main event single star at some point? Possibly even a world champion? Without a doubt. He has the talent, the look, and the size, so there's no reason he shouldn't be. But whether that happens or not ultimately rests in the hands of Vince McMahon, so we'll just have to wait and see what the future holds for the former TNA and NXT champion. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow WrestleWithAndy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.